Father, we have gathered tonight around the Holy Word of God, and we are so grateful that not only have you given us your will, which is your written word, but you've also sent the precious Holy Spirit to teach us this word and to guide us into all truth. And we welcome now the teacher of the church, the Holy Spirit, who will give us revelation and insight into your word. Father, I am so grateful that you have satisfied the hunger for revelation knowledge of the people of this church. We thrive on revelation. We love to hear your word, and we love to understand those things which you speak to us. And the more we understand, the more clear the picture of you becomes. So, Father, I thank you tonight for my assignment. I welcome it, and I totally believe the anointing is here to deliver this word where people are built up, where they're strengthened with might in the inner man, and where they have access to your promises through your will. I want to be certain you get all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, Tracy Harris will tell you that if a, if a pastor is teaching the people the uncompromised word of God, and then when he comes to that church, he's able to start at a higher level. And that's what he always commends me on. He says, I can always, uh, always know the people have been taught, and therefore they're receptive and ready to receive. And so he really likes coming here. Him and Jesse DePlanis and Joe McCroskey and Jerry Seville. All right, would you open your Bibles tonight with me to Ephesians chapter uh, 2, and I would like us to gawk at a familiar scripture and uh, launch off of This is our diving board. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, nor of works, lest any man should boast. So, and you understand this, that our salvation comes entirely from the Lord, not of anything we do, not of works. And, you know, and that's what he, uh, Paul had to emphasize this to the church at Ephesus because there were Jews there who were under the law, and they felt that if they kept the law, they would be declared righteous. And Paul says, no, not of works. There's no, we have nothing to do with it. The only part we have in our salvation and becoming righteous is our faith, that we believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died and rose from the dead. That's our part. He does the rest. Because look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. So we're his workmanship. We are his project. He turns us into his image. And because he's our father, he determines what we're going to be in this in, after the new birth. Well, that's some good preaching right there. I didn't know I knew that till just now. Man, praise God. We, uh, we become what he wants us to become, not who sometimes we think we are. Praise God. And notice here, he says, uh, once he has recreated us, we're, we're unto good works. Those good works are not just being a good person, you know, where you give Christmas presents and, and you give offerings and you help people. Those good works are also referring to supernatural feats, supernatural works, signs and wonders. So this, this whole creation thing is a lot bigger than sometimes we realize. And, and I know this for sure, and I think you do too, that when you got born again, you really had no idea what happened to you. You just know that something was different on the inside, and you had to pursue the word to find out what happened to you. You know, it's like a little baby. We got the little baby now, Reed Smith, Angela and Jay's baby. That little kid is finding out who he is and who his parents are. He still doesn't know. He just knows he's got a, a mom that's kissing on him all the time, and dad has to change the diaper. But there, he's their workmanship. Praise God. All right, so now, and we're going to go to 2 Corinthians. We're going to come back to Ephesians if you need to keep your place there. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, Paul says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, and we just read that in Ephesians, when, uh, when you're born again, when you receive Jesus, 
It's not of works lest man should boast. You're saved by grace. So therefore you are a new creature in Christ. You're a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. So now we have become something that never existed before. Now we are a child of God. Now, I remember years ago, um, I used to really like watching Jimmy Swagger. I'm, I'm not a student of his, but I used to like to watch him on TV because he was a soul winner. And one of the things that he said that I did take a liking to, and I've kept it in my spirit, is this. We are not all children of God. We are children of Adam, and we must choose to be children of God. And I've always liked that saying, and it's true. So now that we have this grace working in us, now we are children of God. So now we have to learn who our dad is, just like little Reed Smith. He's got to learn who his dad is because he doesn't know who he is. He, you ask him, he, just, he always says, eh. That's all you're going to get out of him. Now, come down to verse 21. You remember, I read this before, and he hath made him, but let's, let's put those names in there so we knew who was talking. And God had made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God. So God used Jesus to make us what he was. They, a lot of theologians and Bible students call this the great exchange, the great exchange. Jesus exchanged what he was for what we were. So we were sin, he became sin, and we became what he was, righteous. It, they just call it the great exchange. It's just a way of understanding and, and, and perceiving exactly what's happened here. Now, notice the term righteousness, righteous. Righteous means if you're righteous, that means you're right with God. There's nothing left to be done. It's all taken care of. That, that you've accepted the free gift. And that's what it is. Only God can declare us to be righteous. Mm -hmm. Now, there's only two kinds of righteousness. And there's only one that is real, and that is the righteousness of God. The other one is self-righteous. We don't teach self-righteous. It, it does not exist in the church. And you know, um, there are people who will fight with you and argue with you if you tell them, I am righteous. Because that scripture, there's none righteous, no, not one. But they don't finish reading the whole Bible. And there are people who, who cannot accept, they cannot believe that they are the righteousness of God. And a lot of them is because they're in the process of earning it and they don't think they've made the grade yet. Praise God. But we're realizing that righteousness is a free gift. Now, coming from a Catholic background, and thank God for the Catholics, I struggled with this because as a Catholic, I was earning my righteousness, earning my salvation, and I was working my tail off and never got even near, anywhere near it. But now I realize it is a gift. So the title of our Bible study tonight is this, Righteousness versus Holiness. Righteousness versus holiness. People try to mix these two. People try to discount one for the other, and there's a lot of confusion. But we'll just put them both in their, per, in their perspective places, and you'll understand the attributes of righteousness and then holiness. And we'll, we'll see that there is a separation, but we'll, we'll put them in proper perspective, and then you'll understand. So now go back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 1. Paul says, And you hath the Lord quickened, and remember the word quickened in King James, he made alive. You remember you were spiritually dead. When you're, you remember the word death in the Bible is always talking about separation. When you're spiritually dead, you're separated from the revelation of Christ. You don't know who he is. So, but now um, you, Christ has made you alive that you were dead in, in, in uh, trespasses and sins. Where in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, that spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And you can understand. See, that's what you need to understand 
a lot of these people who are doing really ignorant and stupid and, and crazy things, and you think, why do they do this? Well, right there, it's the prince of the power of the air working in them. And if you will look back on your own life, and maybe I'm the only one here, but I look back on my life, when Satan was in my life, I did things that I was never raised to do. Now, I suppose uh, none of you have ever done that, right? <laughs> I mean, you're so far removed from that person. I mean, the only thing I ever see you wearing is halos. That's an awfully long time ago. At least this past year. All right, now, and then among whom also, they're talking about Satan, among whom also we all had our conversation or our lifestyle in time past. Uh, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilled desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of God, even as others. So at the new birth, you, don't, you have no idea what happens to you, but in one, before you say the prayer, you're connected to Satan by nature. You, you naturally do what he wants you to do, fulfill the lust of the flesh, the sinful things. And after that prayer, he's dismissed from your life. He is no longer your father. Now God becomes your father. And you have no idea what's happened to you. And the only way you're going to find out is just like a baby. You're going to have to hang around your new father so he can, you can grow and understand who he is. Are you still listening to me okay so far? Pretty good? All right. So um, we had to be delivered from Satan before we could become righteous. You cannot be a child of the devil or a child of wrath and be righteous. So at the new birth, not only did Jesus declare you righteous, but he also delivered you from the devil and all of his works in your life. But now, you know, as I was, I've been praying about this for years and I, and I said, Lord, I don't understand. How is it that when a person is born again, and they switch fathers, Satan's no longer their father, you're their father, but they continue to serve him. I don't understand that. And, and I said, how can they do that if their nature's been changed? And the Lord said, son, he says, their nature has been changed, but they continue to serve Satan because it was a habit. They were habitually serving him. And so those habits eventually go away or they they fall off once you draw close to the Lord because those are less of the flesh you don't do them by nature any longer you do them by habit habits can be broken praise God see um well I don't, I don't get too far ahead of myself here amen so that's why renewing your mind changes your habits now be less of the flesh used to be your habit now God has become your habit you're just like me. You like to be in his presence. You like to worship him. You like to thank him. You like to hear from him. You like him to touch your life. Now you're developing good, clean, healthy, eternal habits. Praise God. God is a habit. All right, now go ahead and if you would please to Colossians chapter 1 and verse 12. Colossians 1 and 12. Give thanks unto the Father, your Father, which has made us meet. Now, you know the word meet means able. able. Meet is an old Elizabethan word that means able. Uh, the Father has made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness, you know, that's the devil, and hath translated us unto the kingdom of his dear son. So now we have, not only have we been taken out of the devil's uh, grasp and territory influence, but we've been taken, but now we have been moved in to the kingdom of God. Now I used to always think the kingdom of God was like a glass sphere in this world, and you got in there, the devil couldn't get to you. And that's not really a, it's, it's a, it's a visual thing, but it's not all that accurate. The kingdom of God 
is where all the blessings abound. The kingdom of God is a government. When in Isaiah, when he prophesied, he said about the birth of Jesus, the government shall be on his shoulders. It is that, that he would, it would be a kingdom. Now, if you, if you have a king, let's say that Jesus is a king. Wherever he has influence and authority, that would be his kingdom. So we've been translated into the kingdom or the place where Jesus has influence and uh, inroads and, 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 all, and permission to do all these things. So we're now, we are in his kingdom. We're in a completely different place in our lives. It's a system. It's a different way of living. You talk different. Have you noticed in the kingdom, you don't talk like you used to. I, I rarely ever hear anybody in this church talk about their aching back or their splitting head or, or their poverty. I never hear that because that's not how, when you get into the kingdom of God, it's a completely different vocabulary. It's all I hear you people say, well, I'm blessed. Well, God can do this. Yeah, we can do that. Amen. We'll pray. You'll be all right. And that's a completely different system. So that's, and that's a system we're in. It's the kingdom where God, or uh, with the place where Jesus reigns. Now look at verse 14, in whom, still talking about the Father, we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So all our sins are forgiven, but when God forgives a sin, he forgets it. And that's, I mean, that's, that's, that's a total washout. I mean, he has no record of it. That's why when we, we can go, these, that's why he says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Well, why wouldn't we come boldly? Well, because we're going to a holy person and we're packing the, the sin. And he says, no, I've forgiven you. Now you get up here boldly. You look me in the eye. Don't you come whipping up here like a pup. You get up here and, and let's talk. You sit on my knee. You get real close to me. And, and you know, if you don't have your mind renewed, Oh, God, I am so unworthy. Well, he made you worthy when he, when he saved you and caused you to be the righteousness of God. Praise God. And you know what I like about um, uh, the new birth and being a baby, just like little Reed Smith, he's got no past, no history. If, if my sins are forgiven, then I got no past. All that, that old man that was influenced by the nature of Satan that guy and all his works are passed away. And now Jesus deals with the new man. Glory to God. I was talking to Tim Davidson one time, the pastor from North Dakota. And uh, I was talking to him about a person who was abused. And they were having a difficult time putting it down and getting on with their life. And he says, you know, Jerry, he says, I've had a, several people at that in my church and my ministry. And what I do is this. I tell them this. When you were abused physically, sexually, mentally, whatever, however it was, that, that person is now dead because that was before you were born again. But now you're a new creature. And so you need to let that old man die and you need to focus on the new person, the new person that you are because the new person has never been abused by anybody, especially not God. And he says, I've been able to help people get past that just by ministering that, that certain truth to them. You don't have a past. You know, I, I hate it when I run into my old friends. Hey, Lampton, remember when we used to... And I just, oh, man, don't remind me of that. And you know what? A lot of times I'd, I'd, I never have never even think about it till they bring it up. And then, and then most times I tell, you know what? I can hardly remember that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because I've let that man die. I don't relate to him anymore. I am the righteousness of God, and that's where my focus is. I'm in the kingdom of God. I live by a whole new system. Praise God. So we have, we have no past that was of the flesh, but we do have an eternal future with the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, now let's go to Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Now... I'm going to read this. I want to give you a heads up. Pay attention. Don't, let, don't get caught off guard here. Okay? All right. You had your warning. <laughs> Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. Don't do that again. 
How many said amen? One. Doc, I heard you say it. Who else? I've seen about three or four. Go ahead, confess. Get it off your chest. You'll be able to sleep better. I warned you not to do that. Well, well, we just have to forgive you and go on. Never say amen after that because you got to read the whole sentence. There is therefore now no condemnation or judgment to them which are in Christ Jesus, comma, he's not through speaking yet, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So our righteousness empowers us to walk or to live in the spirit, which is the word of God. And as long as you're walking in that, there are no judgments. There's nothing. God's not got no judgments against you. The devil ain't got no judgments. That's why when he comes accusing the brethren, you say, you're a liar. I'm the righteousness of God, and I'm walking after the Spirit. But what about that? You cursed yesterday. Yeah, but if you would have been listening three seconds later, I repented. But you said it. I says, don't count. God forgave me, and he forgot about it. What are you bringing it up for? Yeah, but yeah, but what's the devil? If you want to talk about what I did, let's talk about what you did. You got kicked out of heaven. You know, he doesn't like those conversations. So there is no condemnation to us when we walk after the spirit. Now, a righteous man can do that. Walking in the spirit is obeying God from the heart. Amen. And then look at verse two. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. The law of sin and death is for the unrighteous. The law was a good thing in the sense that it told people that what you're doing is wrong and there's judgment for that. And so if you will keep these commandments, God can bless you and keep out judgment away from you. And, and But once that you become the righteousness of God, you no longer need that little written piece of paper saying this is wrong this is right you know uh, as a catholic and i thank god for the catholics you almost had to carry a paper around because you didn't know what was sin or wasn't sin and then we had sins that were categorized there was mortal sins and venial sins and then sometimes we get in big discussions because we didn't know how many venial sins it took to make a mortal sin because see a venial sin was was like a white lie wouldn't you wouldn't send you to hell but mortal sins well or would send you to hell <laughs> so we don't need a piece of paper anymore that tells us what's right and what's wrong god writes his laws or his will in your heart i know what's right i, I can tell in my spirit if what i do displeases him or pleases him praise god so we the the law of life in christ jesus where you take your righteousness and you live by the word supersedes the law of sin and death. Now, the law of sin and death is still here, but we supersede it. You know, the pilots always talk about, Tracy will talk about it, you know, gravity holds a plane on the earth. But if you if you engage the law of lift, you supersede the law of gravity and it will fly until you, until you get low on fuel, then it goes back to the law of gravity. But you just stop and get fuel and then you go on your way. Praise God. Let's go back to the book of Hebrews you guys are awful quiet tonight. Should I be worried? Mm -hmm. right. Look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Listen to what Paul tells the, the Jews. Follow peace with all men. In other words, avoid strife. And follow holiness. Oh, now here's the, here's the first mention of holiness. Follow, we'll just, uh, it's, it's peace and holiness, but we're studying holiness. So let's just, just go past the word peace there just for, the, just for study purposes. Follow holiness with all men without which no man shall see the Lord. Now, what is holiness? Now, we know what righteousness is. We just spent time understanding what righteousness, it is a gift of God you receive by faith and then grace uh, comes into your heart. And God looks at you as a righteous person. He looks at you like Reed Smith. You're just an innocent baby. And so he wants to begin to put himself in you and to mold you into his image. That's what yielding to the Holy Spirit is. So holiness 
is a separated, sanctified life. It's being Christ-like. Amen. When before the on the uh, when I went back to church, I got out of bed one morning. My girlfriend says, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm going to church." She says, "Why?" I said, "I don't know." And I went to church and I began to look for Jesus. And I went to my beloved Catholic church looking for the Lord. And several years later, I got born again and became the righteousness of God. Well, it was my custom, uh, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, it's pretty bad when, you know, and you and the bartender on a first name basis, and he knows all about, you know, about him. But um, I went down to the bar and I ordered an adult beverage, which is a diet Pepsi to me. And I felt, I felt like, I felt so guilty just sitting in there drinking a pop. And uh, I didn't even finish it. And I, I used to like Diet Pepsi on a, on a, on ice. And it tastes better than beer. And he said, Jerry, you, you want, I'll buy you another Pepsi. And I said, no, no, Dick, I've, I've had enough. I'm, I, I don't, he says, you haven't been around for a long time. And I says, it's going to be a long time since you see me here again. And now there's something in me that was never there before. There was something in me before that glued my hiney to that stool. And the only way to get off is slide off and stagger out. But now there's something else inside of me that said, you know, that that I, it seemed like something in me I was grieving. Maybe it was the Holy Ghost. And so I left there. Now, this is what holiness is. It's, live, it's living a sanctified and, and separated life. And... A lot of people try to do it in their own strength. And once again, you're the righteousness of God now, but sometimes breaking the habits of when you were the child of the devil is really hard. Well, that righteousness that God put in you will empower you to say no. Praise God. Now, I'll, let me just be honest with you. I like beer. And if I could do it, I would, I would drink beer. I'd drink a couple, three beers every night. I like the taste of beer. But I don't do it because, and, and I could still go to heaven. I could drink a six-pack a night, still go to heaven. I'm saved. I'm the righteousness of God. So, but now he says, follow holiness with all men, without which you will not see the Lord. And holiness is a separation unto the Lord and I'm, I hope I'm not getting too ahead of, ahead of myself. Righteousness empowers you to live a holy life. You're made righteous by, the, by God's grace and his supernatural power in the inner man. But now look at verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness spring up or trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. When you're saved by grace, grace empowers you to live a life of righteousness. But when you get entangled with um, bitterness and strife and all those things, then you fall from that grace and it's very difficult to make those decisions and have power to back them up. I mean, it's not the grace that saves you. It's the grace that empowers you to live like a saved person. Oh, I couldn't have said it better myself. So bitterness will rob us of the grace and put us back in our flesh. So he says, deal with that root of bitterness and live peaceful with all men and lead a holy life. Glory to God. Now, we got to find out um, why we want to live a holy life. Go back to Hebrews chapter 6. I'm kind of getting vague, but I'll, I'll straighten this up right here. In Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. Paul says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of the anointed one, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. Now, let me read that to you out of the New Living Translation. So let us stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again and again. Let us go on instead and become mature in our understanding. Surely we don't need to start again with the, with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. So people 
who are committed to a holy life are not perfect people. Amen. They are people that make the same mistakes, but they recognize it quick, and they're quick to repent, quick to forgive, which is, enables them to live a holy life. Now, the reason I, I live a, a separated life or a life of holiness is because it's not to maintain my salvation, but rather that the supernatural power of God can flow out of my life. Amen. You start compromising the word of God and your convictions, and you will dam up that power. I mean, you're still going to be born. You're still going to be saved. And you're on your way to heaven, but you have to live, live a sanctified life. You know, there, that lady I told you about the golf course that had the seizure and I prayed for her and God raised her up. You know, they, they occasionally says, uh, Jerry, why don't you come out to the house? We'll cook you a burger and give you a beer. And I says, well, I, I think I, I really appreciate the burger, but I'm not going to drink a beer with you. And they, they don't understand that. Well, they says, well, what, what's the problem with that? I mean, can't just because you go to church mean you can't. I says, yeah, I can drink a beer. And I try to convey to her, you know, as listen, if I would have if I don't leave live a, se a separated life then I'm not going to have the power when I need it to pray for you if you have a seizure. And they just they just quite, can't quite understand that. Praise God. So holiness enables you it your righteousness empowers you to live a, a holy life and holiness is what causes the power of God to flow out of your life. Amen. Now, look at 1 Thessalonians, just a simple little scripture. At 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 22, it's just, you probably don't need to turn there, but it says, abstain from all appearance of evil, or shun the very appearance of evil, some one translation says. If, if we will obey the word, this word, we will safeguard or protect our holiness. You know, um, Kenneth or uh, Jerry Seville had become close friends with Oral Roberts, and uh, Oral Roberts says, "Brother Jerry, I want you to come and visit with me." And so, and he says, "I want to talk to you," and he says, "I'm going to tell you how to have a longevity in ministry." And so, Brother Jerry got his notepad and his pen and his Bible, and he went in to meet with Doctor Roberts, and he thought he was going to get six points in a poem and a, and a bunch of things to do. And he says, this is how you have longevity in ministry. And here's what Earl Robert said to him, shun the very appearance of evil. He says, that's it. He's that's it. And so Jerry Seville has taken that to heart and he is very watchful about putting himself even in a place that has the appearance of evil. You know, um, you know, when he goes out on the road, he'll fly to a place and he has a road team that brings a van or a truck with product and his motorcycle or whatever he has. Well, one day he comes back off of a crusade and he gets a phone call and they says, uh, Brother Jerry, uh, did you have a good hamburger at Hooters? He says, what are you talking about? He says, well, we were going by the Hooters the other day and we seen your van parked there. He says, no, it wasn't my, he says, it wasn't, he says, your name right on the side, JSMI, World Evangelism. And uh, Brother Jerry says, I wasn't in that van. And so he called the guys in that drove that van there. And see that, that is, if people see that, it would discredit him and they would lose their, um, willingness to believe he had the supernatural power of God working in his life. And I don't know if he fired those two guys or not, but I guarantee you one thing, his trucks never stopped there again because <laughs> it's an appearance of evil. And he's very watchful over that. I, I know one time he was in California going to preach and the pastor called me, Brother Jerry, we're very sorry, we're running late. We'll send someone to pick you up. And just they'll be there in five minutes. Just get outside the hotel room. And he goes out there, and this lady pulled up and says, uh, Dr. Seville, the pastor sent me to get you. He says, and you're late already. He says, lady, I appreciate that, but uh, he says, I can't get in the car with you. And 
and go to that thing because you know there's people around here that know me and if they see us together what's that going to do for their for my credibility he wouldn't do it and so they so he said you go get a man to come and get me and so they had to do that but he's he's very watchful because he took to heart what oral roberts says if you're going to have longevity and ministry or whatever god called you to do shun the very appearance of evil amen amen all right praise god so and if we if we make a, a person who's pursuing holiness is quick to repent holy people are not perfect people but they repent they recognize you know and a lot of times you go along and think i didn't think that was that bad but i could feel the holy spirit being grieved inside of me and so i just repented really quick and i'm not going to do that again mm -hmm. that person's pursuing holiness because they want they want that supernatural power of god flowing out of their life all right look at um just a couple more scriptures second corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1 2 Corinthians 7, 1, having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now notice that perfecting holiness. You cannot perfect righteousness. When you became the righteousness of God, you are as righteous as you will ever be. You're never going to get any more righteous than you are right now. But having the promises of eternal life and all these uh, supernatural things, then we have a, an empowerment to cleanse ourselves from all uh, and our um, from all filthiness of the flesh and perfecting holiness or bringing holiness to maturity. And like I said in the beginning, sometimes we can't do it on ourselves because we have been so habitually in tune with the world and the devil that we can't seem to break free of those habits. And, you know, that's when you go to the throne of grace. God, help me. I can't break the addiction for being a peeping Tom. I've had three women beat the fire out of me, and I still can't get over that, Lord. You know, and he begins to help you. If you, if you have it, Lord, I, I don't want to do this anymore. He'll, he'll send the Holy Spirit to help you overcome all those temptations. Praise God. So perfecting holiness is keeping a clean house a clean vessel for which the Holy Spirit can flow. Now, our last scriptures in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. 2 Timothy 2.19. Now the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knows them that are his. That word know, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't look on a piece of paper to see who's, who belongs to his. That word know there means he has a close, intimate, personal relationship. Remember when it says uh, Abraham knew his wife? It's, it's like um, social intercourse. Don't, don't, get, don't put sex in there. It's a social intercourse, which is very, it's intimacy. So God has intimacy in that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That is that if you do that, you're practicing holiness. You're saying no to the to that old man and the old things that you used to do. Now you're practicing holiness. And then he's then he goes on to say in verse 20, in a great house are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also wood and of earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man will therefore purge himself from these, so should be a vessel of honor, sanctified or set apart, and able for the master's use and prepared to any, every good work. So we have, if he told us to um, perfect holiness, and if he tells us to, you know, uh, shun all the appearances of evil and, you know, cleanse himself from all these things, he, he would not tell us that if we weren't empowered to do it. We can do it. It's a choice. And he says, then you're going to be prepared for every good work. And so if you keep your vessel clean, if you keep the sin out, then when it comes time for prayer or, or uh, doing the things of God, there's no hindrance to the power. I always like to compare it to a battery. A, a battery could be fully charged, but if your terminals are dirty, the power can't get out. It restricts it. And so repentance 
cleans those battery terminals and that power of God can flow out. Praise God. So God needs a clean vessel and that's what holiness is for. Righteousness is giving, is puts you in right standing with the Lord. It puts you in the kingdom of God. It's your ticket into heaven and holiness empowers you to move in whatever God wants you to move in in the earth. Praise God. Amen. Do uh, you, you guys hear me tonight? Or Amen. Am I stepping on toes or something here? You're absorbing? All right. I, I thought I'd get at least a, get a grunt. Do we need to have a repentance service here tonight or something? Uh, you know what? I think I'm going to ask Santa Claus if you guys have been naughty or nice. <laughs> All right, praise God. So that's the difference, folks, between righteousness and holiness. In a nutshell, it's very simple. You became righteous by faith. Grace changed your nature. You're the righteousness of God. Uh, you, you can keep that. You're saved. You're going to heaven, despite some of the habits you go back and go into. But if you want to have the supernatural power of God flow through your life, you have to live a separated life. You know, when Kenneth Copeland came here, um, he told me right up front, you know, the, through Barry Tubbs, I know Barry Tubbs, his spokesman, he says, he says, now Jerry, when Kenneth comes, he's going to lock himself in his room and he won't come out until it's time to preach and he don't want to talk to nobody until, uh, until after he's done, if anything at all. And that's just the way he does. He, he gets with the Lord and that's why he flows in those gifts and the, and the prophetic anointing and all those kind of things. He, Kenneth Copeland told us one time at one of his meetings that uh, these people invited him to go up to this camp to hunt deer. And Kenneth says, oh, yeah, I've been wanting to hunt deer for a long time. He said, we've got a great camp, Brother Copeland. Um, you know, Texans hunt different than we. They hang out in trees. They, they lease trees. You run a tree. And that's your tree. You get $1,000, you get that tree for the entire season. And so they they says, we got you a nice tree, Brother Culp. And he says, oh, goody. And, he, and then the, so he gets up there and he gets his gun and he says, oh, and by the way, uh, tomorrow night we're going to have a little meeting. Would you mind preaching? He says, you want me to preach? He says, yeah. He says, all right, I'll preach, but you know I'm not going to be able to hunt now. He says, why? Because I, I made a covenant with the Lord that whenever I'm called to preach, I will lock down and give him all my time in prayer. So, Brother Copeland, we're sorry. And he says, well, that's the way, that's that's my covenant with the Lord. So they all went hunting, and he stayed at the cabin, and he's out on the porch praying. Here come a great big buck by, a, a Texas buck. <laughs> and Kenneth says, he, he had his gun right there. <laughs> he says, Lord, I made a covenant with you. That I would, I, you know, I would lock down and pray, and I'm not going to shoot that deer. Praise God. So, he, now that's just that's. It takes a. He's paying the price for his for what he's God's called him to do. Amen. And you know, the, the more that you live, the more sanctified life or separated life you live, the more anointed and more powerful your ministry is. Praise God. And everybody has a gift in a ministry. I'll talk to you about that on Sunday. Father, I've shared this word tonight. We understand more clearly now the difference between righteousness and holiness. And Lord, my prayer tonight is that you would help us to perfect the, the holiness life because there are people out there who are depending on us to bring them the supernatural power of God. Some of them are not aware of it. And some of them will die without it. And Father, we want your power to flow through us. And once we get into that flow that we don't want anything else, are we willing to do whatever we need to do to keep that switch of faith turned on and that power to flow through our lives? So Father, I thank you. I thank your people who come out this cold night to hear the word. I pray that, pray that you reward them with revelation, ministry opportunities, and bless them mightily. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. amen.